Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Harvey. This is Tom Fennell. Hi, guys. And uh, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. And what we're doing here is telling you about the, the news items that have appeared in, in relating to energy and global warming and things of that nature. In the last week, I have a blog where I look through headlines every day. I look through usually a couple hundred, and I, I glean out of that the articles that I like the best and post them on my blog, which is geoharvey.wordpress.com. And uh, the ones that I select out of the week, which I think this week is 20-some-odd, 20 21 or so, we talk about in this, in this uh, broadcast, and it gives us an ability to focus on trends rather than specific issues. We can talk about specific issues, but the trends are important. And uh, so we'll just do the, we'll do the work for the week. And starting on February 14th, which was last Friday, we have one item from the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Um, even before the TVA finishes building its new nuclear unit, the utility is preparing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars replacing the steam generators because they were faulty <laughs> when they were installed, something like 30 years ago. They've been working on this plant since the 1970s. If, if it comes online as scheduled, it'll be the next nuclear plant in the United States. This is the plant. Oh, you've got a picture of it. Yeah. Isn't that something? If you can't read it there, it says, Steam pours from the cooling tower of the Unit 1 reactor at the Wells Bar nuclear plant near Spring City, Tennessee. Even before the TVA finishes building its new nuclear unit, the utility is preparing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to replace <laughs> faulty steam generators <laughs> in a new reactor within the first decade of its oh operation. Oh, my gosh. Isn't it great that we have such a <laughs> huge... You there's, know, there's probably a backstory there. Well, they 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 started building this thing in the 1970s, and then they realized that the the um, market was not developing the way they expected, so they stopped building this particular one when it got to a particular point, and after that, it sat there basically just getting older, without being used for a long time, and um, so they started pulling parts of it out, which is, you know, got a bunch of parts. Scavenging it. it. <laughs> so they were scavenging this thing for parts yeah. for, for use yeah. in other, other reactors. So by the, uh, by the time that they decided to get it going again, which as I recall was in the 1990s, they, um, it, was in a, it was kind of in a shambles. But they've been building this reactor for a long, long time. And I'm not 100% convinced that it's ever going to be brought online. But you know, it's it may be. I think it. I think it's more more likely than not that it will. Anyway, um, on the fifteenth of February, we got a neat article from uh, from Clean Technica, in a study by IC Cars. The Tesla Model S had an average used sale price of more than ninety nine thousand seven hundred dollars, which is about ten thousand dollars more than the top tier eighty five. Uh, kilowatt hour P85 model sells for new. And that doesn't even factor in the $7,500 federal tax credit for local incentives. That's from Clean Technica. And, you know, this is, um, it's nice to be able to buy you use a new car and sell it used, make a profit. Yeah, it also <laughs> shows you that wealthy people don't like to wait in line. Don't like to what? Wait, wait in, line. in line. Yes, <laughs> they don't like to wait in line. That's true. This is a related story that you didn't really mention, but I caught it. And I'll use Tom Hartman's uh, phrase there, the good, the bad, and the very, very ugly. <laughs> <laughs> this, I find this hard to believe, but in Ohio, there's legislation to ban the sale of the Tesla car. Yeah. And there's already, and it has, it, and they brought it up once and it went down and they're bringing it up again. In Texas, it is now law. You can't sell to Tesla's in Texas, Texas. which has got to change. There's too many wealthy people in Texas. Well, not only that, but it's probably unconstitutional. 
I mean, yeah. If it know. gets that, if it gets to the courts, the courts are going to strike it down. Yeah. Clearly. I mean, but somebody <laughs> has got a vested interest in making sure that these cars are kept off the road. And when the new Teslas come out, um, they've got another model that's coming out in, in the not too distant future. They're talking about having it come out at a price that's going to be on the order of $35,000. And with a, with a yeah. $7,500 uh, tax credit, that, that, would, that would mean that that car is going to be purchased, including the tax credit, for less than the average sales price of a new car. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, again, we're going to open a lot of doors. It is. But Tesla, I think, is, is actually, um, they're playing a game here that I think is very smart. Uh, in which they are selling their technology to other car manufacturers. So we're going to see other car manufacturers using, using Tesla technology. And we are going to yeah. see more about this, this thing in the, in the news that we go through today. While we're, on, well, while we're on the subject of electric cars here, I, I got a couple of notes here. This is something that's on your blog, and it's about China. Oh. About this particular company. Do you have something you're going to talk about? We're going to talk about that, yeah. Okay, this, We're going to mention this that. This company is called the Denza, and their dealerships are selling these chargers. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to buy a charger in America right now, you got to do something to figure out where you're going to buy one. Yes. I mean, they're available because there's already a couple in town, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know... You got to be an early adopter, you know, somebody yes. on top of things to catch yeah. one. But Dens is going to make it easy. You just go back to the dealer and you can buy one. Now I got a couple of notes here about the 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 condition or the state of the art right here in electric cars, and I personally feel in, inside of twenty years they're going to dominate. Well, actually, I, I've seen I've seen projections that they would dominate by twenty twenty. I don't think it's going to happen. Not the Tesla, but the electric yeah, cars. Yeah, the electric car. Well, yeah. it might. Okay. Uh, the, it's not just electric cars. It's, it's electric the combination hybrid. of electric, electric and plug-in hy hybrid. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. plug-in hy hybrid is important because when you start a hybrid vehicle, um, you're not going to get good gas mileage until the engine's warm. Okay. But when, the, when you've got a plug-in hybrid and you're just going to go two miles to the store... You if you can do that four-mile yeah, range yeah, distance, yeah, that makes then sense. you don't need to turn the engine on. So you, it, it really it, it makes a huge difference if you've got a plug-in hybrid. And um, so, Well, one of the big problems that has to be overcome, if they can overcome it, is the actual charging time. Yeah. Did you look at, um, oh, what's it called, redox f fluid batteries? I skimmed it. I didn't, I didn't pay okay. much attention to it. In, in the redox fluid battery, you can charge the car by changing the fluid in the battery. Okay, okay. No. They, they're going to have to come up with creative solutions like that. Yeah. I have read about that before. Because the bottom line is, if you're charging one of these batteries, it takes an awful lot of energy. And yeah. you get hot. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And right now, I, I got some... I got some numbers here. I'll try and pull them up. Right now, at this, the theoretical maximum level of charging in America today, and this is theoretical. You can't buy this on the shelf yet. Maximum DC voltage is 600 volts. Maximum DC current is 550 amps. That doesn't mean Ooh, much wow. to you guys out there. Wow. But that's a lot. You could fry a chicken with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's 330 kilowatts. This is what they're shooting 30 kilowatts. For. Oh, Just my gosh. Just to put into perspective, that would be equal to 10,000 four-foot fluorescent tubes. <laughs> <laughs> but oh the reality gosh. today, and you can buy this in Japan, <laughs> 500 volts. 125 amps. But even that is a whole oh, lot of power. That's My a lot. Gosh. Oh. This is possible using the Chadimo, which is what the <laughs> Japanese call their their system. <laughs> it's interesting because Chadimo is French. It's it's an acronym in French. Cha is charge, day is of, and whatever mo is. Oh charge of the moment or something like that. Oh. But the Japanese have put it into their own language as a phrase that means let's go get a cup of tea. 
this is kind of like the Japanese have a have have a uh, 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 a thing they say pray or borrow. And what does that mean? Play ball. It, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what you yell at the beginning of a baseball game? <laughs> pray or borrow. Pray or borrow. Well, if you want to charge one of these at home now using off-the-shelf technology, <laughs> two hundred forty volts, seventy amps. Yeah, still alive. that is appreciable. There's no that's, question that's about it. That's off-the-shelf technology in America today. And that takes how long to charge? Well, I'll get to that. If you got a, a small one that doesn't require special wiring that you hook up into your house, yeah, 120 volts, 16 amps. That's ordinary household stuff. Yeah. And fast charging limitations is what I got. The 62 and a half kilowatt Chademo. It's 33 times what power you would need to be able to use it with the home charger. If your home charger can charge your vehicle in eight hours, the Chademo proto protocol can change, charge it in 15 minutes. Which means let's go get a cup of tea. Let's go get a cup of tea. Yeah. And the California Air Resources Board, well, you don't need to know that. U.S., we use SAE standards. And the AC level one was the one I just mentioned. They call it 117 volts, 120 volts. What's the difference? 16 amps max. The level two, which is still something you can buy off your off the shelf, 240 volts, 70 amps. And this is already getting ready for mar for market. Is the mm -hmm. they, they won't be called the Chademo protocol in America. It's going to be S A S A E. J1772. Remember that, folks. Yeah, remember <laughs> that one. You're going to need to know that if you want to buy it. No, one. you won't need to know that. And that's proposed 400 you, volts you, DC. Oh, my gosh. Okay, 200 amps, and yeah. that's 80 kilowatts. Okay. I don't think I have any more on that. Well, we got to we, we got to be moving on because we've used okay. Let's go. 10, Twenty percent of our time on ten percent of the news already, and the next item up is leading investment bank Citigroup, says Australian t uh, utilities will be impacted by energy Darwinism, that is currently sweeping the global energy electric industries, and the Australian utilities have a high risk that they will come off second best. And ladies and gentlemen, the Australians are not the only ones. And we have talked about this before. The American utilities are, the European banks are saying that the American utilities are in for a perfect storm because the price of power is just going down from renewables and it's going down to below the price of power from, uh, from um, traditional. What have you got there? This is part of the energy Darwinism thing. Oh, it's yeah. A picture of the transmission grid as it exists. So you got a couple of generating stations, pipe, large generating stations piping it into the grid. Now, mm -hmm. this is Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla. Yeah. This is, this is technology that dates and it back sense, then. almost 100 years yeah. old. And it goes into a distribution grid and homes, businesses, factories. Yep. Okay, and just for to get you into, into into thinking about it, this guy here is transmission. This guy here is also transmission. The guy on the right, guy on the left. This one of these these this size transmission lines running over, up the West River. Okay. And these things you already see. Now, what's interesting about this picture on the left is it came from a British site. The British are in the process of taking those particular towers down and replacing them by cables. Okay. Now, oh, we'll move along. Uh, here's one of your local. I'm not going to bother talking much about that. One of that. the local things. This is the new proposal for... And this is important. This really is important. We hear about solar and, and wind being um, intermittent. Wind is not really intermittent at all. In fact, it's it may be less intermittent than nuclear because the wind is always blowing somewhere and the, and the, net, the, the grid transmits the power back and forth. What is intermittent, solar, definitely intermittent daily, but it comes on at exactly the time that the peak <laughs> demand comes. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's an almost perfect match to, to the power grid. And, um, well, you go ahead. This is the, new, the newer model, and it's still going to have some large trans... Uh, generation, 
Mm -hmm. But they're going to have smaller localized grids, local distribution, they call them. And in this particular instance, they got one that's in a residential zone. And it's interesting that they put electric cars in there. Yeah. Because the electric car, at least as it's being thought of now, is going to be a storage device. Yes, and it, we will get into that more, too. Good. Yeah. And then, of course, they're going to, in the industrial part of town, they're going to have their own local network. And no, more and more industries are putting in their own power and systems. And, you know, other sources besides these big grids are going to be putting yeah. stuff into the grid. Yep. And I have absolutely no idea what those <laughs> green things are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we go on? We shall go on. Okay. Um, let's see. New analysis shows that additional costs associated with building to the proposed zero carbon standard in the UK have declined significantly since 2011. That's a short period of time. And will continue to fall as we approach 2020, that from Clean Technica. I don't think we need to go into comment on that. Do you have anything on that, Tom? Well, I just got a picture of a zero, zero carbon plant. Oh, good. I'll see if Neat. I can get it up. This there is the go. largest zero carbon building in the world right now. It's really? In it's in Arizona. Okay. And I can't tell you much about what it is. I think that's just a fence. But over here, if you can see my mouse there, there's solar power. Yeah. But there's more to it than that. And yeah. I, I really don't know. Yeah. We're seeing, car we're seeing buildings uh, being built that, you, that produce more energy than they use. And this came and, from the article. And, you know, I, I mentioned last week there was, a, there was one in, in Devons, Massachusetts, where the owner is saying that the excess power that his house generates over what it uses is enough to drive an a, uh, electric vehicle 30,000 miles a year. That's pretty neat. Isn't that neat? <laughs> So what this what this says about the house in Arizona at today's prices, the typical additional cost of building a semi-detached house, I guess that'd be a row house, to the zero carbon standard could be less than five thousand pounds. What's that? About seventy five hundred dollars? Uh, a little bit more. I think it's about eight, about eight thousand dollars. But the price is going down so fast, you know that we had That's a what it beautiful says quote from Amory Lovins, who was talking about about. Uh, heating plants, and he said heating plants are so 20th century. It's cheaper <laughs> not to have one. <laughs> you know. Well, they're, th they're talking about what they just said, 5,000 pounds. By 2020, that's expected to be 3,500 pounds. Yeah. A, uh, next, on the 16th of February, we got news from Clean Technic again. A new white paper report finds that wind energy is keeping electric bills low for American homes and businesses thanks to plummeting wind energy costs driven by technology improvements. We've That's mentioned the improvements, the, the uh, software going in, which can improve the, the performance of a, of a wind turbine by as much as 10%. Yeah, yeah. and there's more of that stuff coming. There, yeah, but the, right now the cheapest, the cheapest power uh, contracts in the United States are for wind, and they are at a, they're at $25 per megawatt hour. Um, more commonly, thirty dollars per megawatt hour, where traditional gas plants are are at like forty to forty five dollars per megawatt hour, and if you take away the, the if you if you add in the in federal incentives to wind, in that they're, the two of them are just neck and neck, mm -hmm. but that's new wind and traditional old gas plants. Mm -hmm. New gas plants have to get another twenty five percent or so, so the New wind plants up against new gas plants, and this is a cheap type gas plants. This is not peaking gas plants, uh, which are very much more expensive. Um, it, running one against the other, the wind is about 80% of the cost, but it can also sign a contract for a long term where, where a natural gas plant can't do that because, because they don't know what it's going to cost. They don't know what it's going to cost to buy the gas. Okay. Moving on, Stanford professor Mark Jacobson and his colleagues have put a new roadmap to renewable energy for all 50 states. I and we're going to see Tom has that. got yeah. a picture of that roadmap. The intera interactive roadmap is tailored to minimize, to, I'm sorry, to maximize resource potential for each state. And what he, what he has done is he, he's got a, a, got a, uh, um, 
he's got a website. There it is. You just went by it. Well, this is it. This, uh, oh, that's this it? Is, this okay. is already it. The, okay. If, if you can write this down, The Solutions Project. HTTP slash slash thesolutionproject.org. If yep. you Google The Solutions Project, it's going to come up. Yep. And, and you have to scroll down when you first get to this thing because you're yeah, likely to get an ad or something. difficult. No, it's not. But, it, it's, it, but what first comes up is a map. And I'll uh, put it up here. When you scroll down, what first comes up is a map. <laughs> well, I've been scrolling down. They can't see that. <laughs> yeah, I know. But here we've got a map that is showing what his, he says the resources are for Vermont. Uh, there's a map. map comes up, and when you mouse over a state, that little uh, block comes up. Yep. And then when you click on the block, the next thing that comes up is a very, it's too big for the screen, but a specific recommendation for your state. And in some cases, the bigger cities are on there as well. Oh, interesting. So here we got Vermont, the Solutions Project Suggestion for Vermont. Right. And I guess we can see the whole mix there. Yeah. Now, I'm going to return to this in another, in another news thing in just a moment. So I, th so I want we'll, we'll we, we'll to hold come back that. To it. Yeah, we'll so, come back uh, to it. There's more stuff here, and we'll come back spend a little more time yeah, on it. Yeah. There's a lot there, and yeah. it's, it's kind of fun because, it's like I said, it's interactive. And, uh, I, have a, I have a little problem with this thing, though. And I, we'll talk about we'll talk, that in a moment. I think I, I may have the same problem. <laughs> but we'll get around to okay. that. Okay. Next, operators of the Davis-Bessey nuclear plant that sits beside Lake Erie say workers have found oh, a gap in the too. concrete of a protective wall. An NRAC spokesman told The Blade newspaper in Toledo. I've actually heard of that elsewhere, Toledo Blade. It's an important paper, I think. It's too early to say whether the gap is a problem. Now yeah, there's the plant. Oh, good for you, Tom. All right, next. And that came from Ra Michigan Radio. Um, this from the Energy Collective in 2013 was more than a rough year for weather. It was a sign of things to come. Drought and storms have always been with us, but climate change is making them more intense, the equivalent of pumping them with steroids. What this, do you got there? Oh my gosh! Yeah, this this That's this sad. came off the map, but off off that website. I think people in Vermont have seen too much of this. Well, this <laughs> picture on the left is a flood in Colorado in 2013. Yeah. The picture on the right is a flood in Brattleboro in 2011. I was going to say that looks like Brattleboro there. That and looks that like car there flood. on the right is my car. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> no. Is that the car you still drive? No, no that's I didn't think so. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the words of my mechanic, that's toast. Toast, yeah. Uh, very um, unfortunate. That, it was a good car. That, was that Irene? Yeah. Yeah. After Irene, um, my, my landlady, Tori Weekers, went down to, uh, this, uh, down to the street after the water had receded, and she went down the street collecting the fish that were in the middle of the road. <laughs> and we <laughs> still have a... No, there were minnows. They were getting returned to the, to oh, the streams. Oh, okay. That was nice and, But we still have a catfish in a, in a fish tank in our greenhouse. Okay. That <laughs> came from there. I got another picture here, I think. Yeah, this okay. is it. This, this is a, a flood in Japan. As a matter of fact, it's, it's in the town of Fukushima. Oh, wow. Let me, let me pull this guy up. The one on the left. It's up on the screen. Yeah, well, it's yeah. easier for me to see it on oh, your okay. screen yeah. because I, I don't have that my glasses. That was clipped from a film, a video. Okay. And these things were roiling and oh my going gosh. up and down in the, in the, in the water. I mean, yeah. this, this is downtown Fukushima, yeah. and these cars are just floating around, bobbing like ducks in a bathtub. Plastic ducks. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so we have to get going on because, unfortunately, we're going to run out of time if we stand on this too long. On the 17th, a story says farmers in the UK are increasingly finding that renewable power production makes their farms financially more viable. It gives them another crop, you know. And 40% of UK farmers are investing in renewable energy compared with just 5% in 2010. They see what's going on. Yeah. You know, that's not unique to just uh, England. I mean, you drive, yes, I know you drive that. drive up to Bellows yeah. Falls along Route 5. I know, I know. You go by and you see 
solar panels in a field, it's a farm. Yeah. This next one, in Australia, the stuff that's going on in, in Australia is just bizarre. The, <laughs> the Abbott government has appointed a self-professed climate skeptic to head extensive... Now, I, I have to tell you, in the world of today, we can say for sure that a climate denier is, 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 in, in, is operating on fringe science. But we have got to a point where a climate skeptic is in the, is in the area of fringe science. Because almost 100% of scientists have accepted the idea that we've got human-caused climate change going on. And the, the UN has said, said there is absolutely no doubt. All right, they have a, appointed a self-professed climate skeptic to hell, head an extensive review of Australia's renewable energy target. And, and um, the Prime Minister has signaled before Christmas the target will be wound back or scrapped altogether. And this is a, this is a, a government that is pushing coal. And who they're going to sell that coal to, I don't know. But the, the person that they, that they put on this thing to head the thing, head the thing had already been charged with felonies. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go past this. <laughs> Larger companies from, and that was from The Guardian, this is from Daily Finance. Larger companies from a variety of backgrounds, including ExxonMobil, DuPont, and BP, are seeing the potential in biofuels and are investing in a range of different advanced biofuel technologies. I want to go back to this in a while when we go back to that map. Yeah. Unless you've got something specifically on it. I've got just one quick picture we'll show, I think. Okay. Of, uh, yeah. What in the world is that? Well, that's a that's a gloved hand. Oh, right? okay. Yes. And These are the pellets, torrified bio pellets. pellets. Bio yeah. Pellets. Yeah, torrified pellets. That's basically like coal, except that it's yeah, it's charcoal. It's, it's charcoal. Yeah, but it was compressed biomass. Yeah, and it it, it means that it's going to burn cleanly as opposed to coal, which yep. doesn't. Yeah. It means the coal ash is not going to be radioactive, and the coal is not going to be putting mercury into the air, and it's not going to be putting sulfur into the air. And it also means that you've got something which is, is going to be, as you said, compressed high energy. Yeah. yeah. And from what I read, they're mixing this in with uh, wood, wood chips. Mixing it with wood chips. Well, I think yeah. that's what, the, that's what uh, I Why not? Why not? Okay. Um, Co-firing was the word they okay. used. I think that's what they mean. Okay. Co-firing makes sense. Daily Finance gives us this information. Larger companies... Oh, I've already read that. That was from Daily Finance. Exposure to companies with extensive... Now, this is financial exposure, by the way. This is what we're talking about. With extensive fossil fuel reserves and companies with high carbon emissions ranks as the top concern among trends in environmental, social and governance issues driving pension funds to examine the risks and craft responses. This from pensions and investments. And I got to tell you, we're going to see a lot of divestment going on. We really are. Because the, 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 you know, the, when they talk about the carbon bubble breaking, it's going to break, I'm, I'm quite sure. And there are going to be a lot of people who get burned. And what we're talking about here is money guys. We're talking about money, guys. Yeah, absolutely we are. That is right. Okay, on the 18th of February, we got this from the Yakima Herald Republic. Yakima? How do you pronounce it? I think it? it's Yakima. Yakima. I think you're right. Yeah. A Seattle company hopes, hopes to harness some of the fiercest winds off the Pacific coast. I know you have a picture of this. This is kind of yeah. cool. Principal Power got the nod from the U.S. Department of Interior to proceed with its application to lease 15 square miles of federal waters near Coos Bay. I'm assuming that's Coos Bay. No, that's New Hampshire. It's Coos Bay out there. It's Coos Bay? Okay. <laughs> Coos Bay in Oregon. And we have a picture here. This is what they want to put in. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing if that thing is licensed as a ship. It probably is, because yeah. it is. It's a barge. Yeah. It's floating. This is a floating wind turbine. This is the kind of thing that I think would take that, that 8 megawatt or 6 megawatt or that kind of gigantic wind turbine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, um, 
these things are huge. Uh, an eight megawatt wind turbine, the nacelle weighs 360 tons. <laughs> that guess, will hurt if it drops on your toe. Truck. It's bigger. Bigger than a truck. Yeah, the yeah. nacelle of that big one that was eight megawatts was 28 by 28 by 48 feet. That's big. That's big. You could build, you could put quite an apartment in that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could have, you could have two stories and have a lot of storage in the attic and, and a basement too. You know, I mean, it's just goodness gracious. Okay. The reason, the reason why they're doing it this way in this particular part of Oregon, two things. One is an enormous amount of wind. Oh, yeah. And the other one is, this is too deep to anchor these things on the ocean floor. Right. We, they don't have a big continental shelf in the West Coast like we have in the East Coast. Right. So they've got to bring them out to sea. They're tethered. They're anchored to something at the, on the ocean floor. Right. Right. And that, that is a, um, I don't know, it might actually be, they're, they're talking about this as, as, a, as a superior way of doing things. And you could do this anywhere in the ocean. You know, you could, you could put these you things put farther these out. You could put these in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you have to keep them out of the shipping lanes. Yeah. But they're pretty well defined. Yeah. The ships don't just randomly run across the ocean. Not only that, but ships that are out in the ocean have radar, and these things are not going to be missing from the radar. And they're going to know where they are. Stealth wind turbine. There's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably one out there already. <laughs> All right. Um, nuclear engineering tells us international ratings agency Fitch said that nuclear generators are likely to be cash flow negative in 2014 because of the large spending programs and weak electric demand in Western Europe amid a general in environment of uncertainty. Now, that's European nuclear, but American nuclear, I think, is also facing exactly the same situation, except that it doesn't have quite the environmental un uh, environment of uncertainty in terms of political uncertainty. But, you know, this makes us think about Exelon saying they were going to be shutting down, winter, uh, it was shutting down nuclear plants if they didn't start developing positive cash flow. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. They've got to be profitable. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, yeah. they're investing Absolutely. money to get, a to get a return. If that's the return right. isn't there, they're going to stop investing. That's right. And those, the plants, this is something that, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but... Many of the of the nuclear plants in the United States have to be upgraded to address problems that became obvious in the Fukushima disaster. The next thing is Egypt's domestic market may reach 80% usage for new and renewable energy by 2025, according to Mohammed Musa Umram. <laughs> First, I'm, I'm sorry, Mohammed, if I mispronounced your name. First secretary uh, at the at the Ministry of Energy and Electricity, that came from Al Bawaba, which was I am sure that that's an Egyptian, um, but they're eighty percent Egypt, eighty percent renewable by twenty twenty five. Why can't why can't we do do that? Well, do you know, Saudi's doing something very similar. Yeah, they are. I mean, they they've decided it's better for them to sell the oil. Yes. <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what does that tell you <laughs> about the relationship between the value of oil and the value of renewables? They're going to put in renewables for themselves and sell the oil to somebody <laughs> else because the oil brings a bigger price. And they have vast, vast, vast areas of potential for solar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. A quarter of the country, they, it's the southeast corner. They call it the empty quarter. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be empty forever. Well, people can't live there. How, <laughs> I know, but so it people, It hasn't been able to support life. Yeah. There may be an occasional gazelle going through there or something. Well, But that's going to be all solar. I mean, yeah, yeah. Except one thing about solar is that it's not going to perform well if it's hot. They'll work on that one. They'll work they'll, on they'll that. They that absolutely will, yeah. China is set to become a global leader for electric vehicle fast charging. ABB... A power and automation technology group is working with Sichuan BYD Daimler New Technology Corporation. Daimler, is that a Chinese name? <laughs> <laughs> On the rollout of record EV fast charging network. Now, isn't this telling that the Chinese are running ahead of the United States in one more 
real way. I mean, this is it, what we've it, talked it, briefly about this yeah. before. It's just, this yeah. is that from that article. This yeah. pictures from that article. Yeah. That's a that's a nice looking car. It is. Chinese car. I don't think I like the color. Well, <laughs> is the color because it's an electric vehicle? I mean, if it is, then I'll take that color. I would but, imagine the color is an advertising thing. Ah, uh, okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't okay. think they paint all these car all their cars this color. <laughs> Probably not. You could do it. You know, you could do the what Henry Ford did with it and make it all any every color. But any, what, any color any, as, as long, long as it's black, black yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, from Investigative Post, benefits of 100% renewable New York. That's the title of the ah. article. How does this sound for New Yorkers? Saving $2,000 in annual energy costs or saving $4,100 per person in energy, health, and climate costs combined? Well, you can do it by going to renewable power. That's why New York is going so heavily in renewable power. $4,100 per person. What is that? You know, as I think about it, if I had a five-person family compared to my current income, if I could save that much money, I'd be richer than I am now. <laughs> richer than you are now. Even though I'd well. be buying food for five people. <laughs> You'd be able to buy cigars. <laughs> yeah right. There's, you know, did you have you thought by the way that cigars are renewable? Not everything that's renewable is good for you. I guess they are. Yeah, they're yeah. renewable. <laughs> okay, now we're up to the nineteenth. Wind power has saved. Uh, this is a past tense. It's already happened. Saved Ireland more than one billion euros in imported energy costs, cut greenhouse emissions, and has not added to customer utility b energy bills according to Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Well, I've traveled extensively in Ireland, and there's a lot of wind farms. Oh, yeah. And yeah. They're not terribly concentrated. But you go in this mountain range and it's six or seven, you drive another 10 miles and it's... I've got some films. I haven't even edited them. I'll, I'll have to bring <laughs> one in. Taken out the window of a car if some of these... Uh, well, I, I think I told you what my daughter said about Wales. That it, she said, I, I Wales is so beautiful. It. It's got these wonderful mountains, and they're covered with sheep and and wind wind turbines. <laughs> you know, and I mean, she wasn't expressing any preference for wind turbines there. She just thought they were beautiful because of the way they did, very gracefully went around. A lot of people think that they're very beautiful. And I in think fact, they are. I think it's they a had a sculpture. Yeah, they had a a. a um, um, poll of, of visitors to Cornwall so a few weeks ago and the, and 92 of the percent of the visitors said they didn't really care one way or the other about the wind turbines. Uh, Two percent said that they objected and maybe they would you know they'd consider whether or not to go back to Cornwall because they, the wind turbines bothered them but six percent said that they found them an attraction. Mm -hmm. So Okay, now we can find some more about them here on the 20th. Oh, wait a minute. I haven't read this next one from the IEEE Spectrum. Uh -huh. A recent poll of climate experts asked what investments they would recommend to combat climate change. The numbers are these. 29% said distributed renewable power. And we can, you know, that map that you there, that thing that you had on... on um, I think this is it. I think this one is... Oh, right. okay, yeah. All right, good. Well, we'll learn something. Well, IEEE Spectrum, if I explain what it is, it's sort of like popular science for electrical engineers. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... They're technical, which is the I, IEEE Annals. or the IEEE, Okay. But this this is a monthly publication, and it's, like I said, it's like popular science for electrical uh, engineers. Who, so it's not, not really popular science. It's a it's little bit more, up. It's just more sophisticated. But it's that. not but it's the, light the reading. PhD stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's light reading for, for, for electrical guys. Yeah, yeah. Electrical <laughs> guys. It's a good publication. I would recommend it. It is, yeah. 29% for distributed renewable power. 26% say go for efficiency. That's where you want to put your money. 17% for next generation nuclear. I'm completely blown away every time I come across that because they, these people are talking about investing in a, in a 
in a product that has never been built and which cannot come online for at least another 16 years. But these are the guys that are working on the next generation. It's true. It's true. I don't buy it, though. And 10% for centralized renewables. And I want to point out that that means between distributed and centralized renewables, 39% are saying, are saying um, for, for renewables. Which so is centralized renewables would be large scale. Large scale. Wind farms, wind. large scale solar. Yeah. Large, uh, possibly um, biomass. Biomass can be large scale, yeah, yeah. and um, and also things like uh, um, geothermal yep. power generation, <clears throat> which is not the same as home geothermal thermal heating. Anyway, um, on the twentieth, which I guess is today, isn't it? We've got well, hey. five items here for the twentieth. <laughs> Imperial College Research says useful life of turbines, this is wind turbines, may be longer than some people have asserted. Countering claims machines need to be replaced after just 10 years. And I've heard this. People are saying, you know, well, the wind turbines aren't any good. They have to be replaced after 10 years. No. As a matter of fact, most of them are warranted for 20 years. Wind turbines can remain pr productive for up to 25 years. Actually, what they're finding is wind turbines should be productive for up to 25 years. They can be productive longer than that. I so, would expect, I mean, you know, with routine maintenance, maybe periodically replacing things like bearings, they, yeah. they could last a lot longer. I would think. I mean, what's the projected lifetime of a car versus what you see here in Brattleboro? I'm driving a 27-year-old car, <laughs> and I love it. My, my <laughs> brother has had one car. One car. One car. He's my older brother. Yeah. Look at me, folks. My older brother <laughs> has had one car. Does you he know, drive it? <laughs> he has. I think he's p probably put at least a hundred miles on it. <laughs> <laughs> he's also put a few hundred thousand dollars into restoring it. But let's go from there. No, seriously. I mean, there are cars on the road that that have been been um, their their. Uh, uh, they're antiques, but if you take care of them, they can keep going. Yeah. You know? And, and really, in his car, the reason why it cost so much was because the car was, it was a valuable car because only 20 of them were built, but it was, it was um, the, the big deal was that it had serious problems. That's, that was what the restoration costs were. But um, once, once it's in good shape, the cost of keeping it in good shape is basically the garage mm -hmm. jacking it up mm -hmm. uh, you know mm -hmm. um, if the if it's going to be off for any long period of time preparing the engine for that kind of thing mm -hmm. but uh, otherwise making sure that you run it every couple of uh, few, every couple of months every couple of weeks possibly just out of curiosity what kind of car is it it's a 1937 Aston Martin touring car oh wow yeah it's quite <laughs> it's quite beautiful I it's a very it. beautiful car i bet it is and my son restored it for him. Okay, Saudi Arabia will spend $173 billion. I talked about this. Yes, you did. On energy projects between now and 2018. Saudi, fuel, uh, Saudi Arabia is investing heavily in renewable energy in a bid to curb domestic consumption of fossil fuels, which eats into oil export revenues. The fossil fuels are more valuable financially than the renewables, or to put that another way, it is cheaper to use renewables than it is to use the fossil fuels. Uh. Now, what does that tell you? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. A large amount of radioactive water, estimated to be 100 metric tons, has leaked from a holding tank at Fukushima Daiichi. The water is being absorbed into the ground and is not going directly into the ocean, according to TEPCO. Well, that's good, isn't it? Well, <laughs> nothing out there is Can good. Can you believe anything TEPCO says? No. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, this, that thing at Fukushima, the, I, we have clear evidence that there's stuff going on there that we just have not been... Oh, I see it. I see a yeah, typo we, in the next. We section. don't necessarily have a need to know, but the poor people living there do, and they're not finding. Yeah, well, out you know, on. I mean, that business about about a fuel fragment being found, or fuel fragments plural being found a mile and a half Miles from the plant, away, yeah. is is clear. And we don't hear about that. 
and it has been confirmed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States, but I have to say, they did it by accident. There's no question about that. That confirmation was accidental. I heard it. I'm quite certain of it. They didn't mean to say that it was a mile and a half from that it was real. <laughs> Somebody slipped. Okay. Now we're back to Mark Jacobson's maps, uh, his uh -huh. road map to renewables. And I noticed that my blog has a, has a typo in it here. But let's go back to the road map to renewables. It says his proposed road map to 100% renewably powered U.S. has a lot of solar and hydro in it. Uh, and wind, but for the most part, it's wind power. Biomass is notably absent. Well, yeah, I noticed that specifically in the Vermont, which is coming up now. I'll try to get it. Now, I'm going to read the next thing while Tom is doing this because we, I'm sure he doesn't have a picture for the next one, and I, I can return to it with knowledge of the next one. This Government Andrew Cuomo has announced 18 projects that receive funding through the Renewable Heat New York plant program to help install high-efficiency, low-emission, wood-fired heating equipment, according to a recent article in Biomass Mag Magazine. Now, Where are they going to get the wood? I'm going to get it from wherever. <laughs> All right. They'll barge it in. You know about what happened up in Springfield, right? The Springfield plant did not get its certificate of public good. I guess I didn't know that. Okay. This was something that I found profoundly disturbing because the, uh, 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 what is it, Toxic Action Network? It's a place, it's, it's in It Boston. begins with a C. Toxic. Something Action, it's CAN, C-A-N. Okay. They sent out a, they sent out a um, uh, thing announcing victory because the biomass plant that they were planning on building in North Springfield did not get its certificate of public good. I have been writing for Green Energy Times and I've been writing f in favor of biomass for a couple of years now. And um, when I, I really hadn't focused on that plant and I should have. And I have to apologize for not doing that because I should have. And when I went to the, to the website of the, of the group that was opposing the plant, what I saw was very clear, very clear misunderstanding of the, of the science. Um, and there was a group of people who were holding up a sign that said, biomass, not in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I hit that and I thought, what? <laughs> What are they talking about, biomass not in Vermont? So I went to the, uh, the Agency of Natural Resources website to find out how much biomass was being used. According to the Agency of Natural Resources, we get 6% of our electricity from biomass right now. Most of that's probably coming out of Burlington. Well, some of it, a large part of that is coming out of biodigesters, which are scattered hither and yon in Vermont. There are on a farms. lot of uh, there are a yeah. lot of them on farms. Yeah, yeah. Middlebury College has got a big yep, biodigester, right. and you know this is something which I find very exciting because and and of course a lot of it comes from from waste facilities, um, uh, municipal waste facilities, but also capped over um, uh, landfills, landfills. Yeah. because it's really important that we not let that methane get into the atmosphere. It's really important, even if we can't get energy from it, that we burn it because the carbon dioxide that you make by burning the methane is, is only 5% as, as devastating to the environment at most of but what the methane is. Pretty, pretty methane, good. depending upon the scientists that you're hearing, they, they estimate it's 20 times to bad, as bad to 50 times as bad. And um, admittedly, this particular plant was planning, they were, they were talking about burning wood but 6% of our electricity and 12% of our heat comes fr from, from wood. biomass. Mm -hmm. And okay. most of that 12% of heat is coming from wood. Mm -hmm. And my recollection, and I could be wrong on this, but my recollection is it's 650,000 uh, cords per year, which would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 million tons. And where does that wood come from? Were you at that meeting? Yeah. Yeah. And he talked about exactly this. Exactly. 
We've got forest resources in Vermont. The forests have to be stewarded, particularly in an, in an era where, where we've got species of trees being eliminated by global warming and the consequences of global warming, such as the woolly adelgid um, killing all the hemlocks, the emerald ash borer uh, very likely killing all of our uh, ash trees. <clears throat> we've got funguses that are attacking our maples. We've got uh, various uh, things attacking birches and beaches and um, the, our, our high altitude um, hilltop uh, forest habitats are being destroyed by other things, mostly the actual warming itself, so that the spruces and the uh, firs are, are in trouble. And in the course of all of this, we have to steward the, the forests and we have to remove wood. And that wood is going to have to be burned. It's yeah. going to have to be burned. There are already wood burning biomass electric generation plants, at least one that I know of in the United States, that is there not because they need the electricity, but because they need to get rid of diseased trees. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're doing it. And when they burn them, the disease doesn't spread. That's right. Now, what's going on in in North, in, the, in, in Vermont is that we're burning firewood that in many cases people get from their own um, woodlots. In many cases they buy it, which is not too bad if you're buying it locally. Which mostly they are. Mostly they are, but when people get firewood from Wyndham County and they, and they carry it to Chittenden County, they're spreading whatever mm -hmm. diseases we've got to Chittenden mm -hmm. County. And the, and the people who are in the, in the Agency of Natural Resources are saying, please don't do that. It's not nice. Yeah. You know? So we need, to, we, need to, we need to burn a lot of this wood. And Let me interject one thing here. What's that? A lot of people burning stuff in fireplaces. Some of those fireplaces and stoves are very old. Yes. And you look at what's coming out of chimney. It's very dark. A lot of particulates, <laughs> a lot of bad stuff. That's right. The biomass that's going in, particularly the one they just, they just put up in uh, Middlebury, state yeah. of the art. Yeah. You can't see any smoke coming out of the chimney. Right. And that's very important. These things are scrubbed. They got special equipment in there. The one in, in, in North Springfield, they were saying that they were going to remove 99.9% .9 plus of the particulates. So what was the objection to? It's dirty. It's dirty. Just yeah. Just that's, that's They're using wood from the forests. They can get better efficiency by burning the wood in their own wood stoves in their homes. Now, this was something I that, I, that I saw at the thing. <laughs> Why would we permit all. this to be getting 28% or whatever the, the figure was, efficiency in a, in a biomass plant when we can get 80% efficiency at home? And I, I want to I stress... Who's getting 80% at home? <sighs> Nobody. <laughs> okay. But here's the here's actually that's not true. I, I know a way of getting eighty percent efficiency out of wood at home, but it's not using the the stuff that they're doing. It would be using a rocket mass heater. Using what? A rocket mass heater. I'm not sure. I know I'll explain that, that in a minute. Um, what happens with these with these biomass plants is you get whatever efficiency you get, and the highest efficiency rating I've seen is from equipment from GE, which says that they can get ninety percent. Now, 90% efficiency is not bad. You're not going to get anything better than that. You're not going to get anything better than that. And actually, it's, I have to say, wait a minute, I'm sorry, back off that. It might be as low as 60% because they, they're, they're going to they're, they're the use the heat to, yeah. to do some of their... But from the gas that comes off, because they're doing wood gasification, they're getting 90%. And, all right, for the stoves... I had a, an experience several years ago where I was presented with a question, which was, how can you tell me that you're getting, um, uh, that, you're, that your stove is reducing your, your uh, wood consumption by 75%? It's unbelievable. My stove is 75% efficient. And if my stove is 75% efficient, and I can reduce my, my um, fuel, the amount of fuel, by 75%. That means that my stove would be 300% um, efficient. 
<laughs> Sorry, you, you're not you're not doing happen. things that way. It isn't going to happen. The problem is that when you see a, a wood stove and it's rated by the EPA at mm -hmm. seventy three percent or eighty percent or whatever, they don't mean that you're going to get eighty percent efficiency from the heat potential of the wood delivered to your house. Okay. They mean that you're going to get 80% efficiency in taking the heat potential of the wood and turning it into fire. Okay. They are not addressing how, how efficiently that fire is transferring its heat to your house. So they're kind of fudging the statistics. They don't have a choice. They don't know how these things yeah. are going to be installed. Yeah. But when you look at the rocket mass heater, the people who are dealing, you know, they, they don't sell rocket mass heaters. You build them yourself. The people who are working with rocket mass heaters say, okay, here's how it works. You have a rocket stove, you put a cap over it, which is an, basically an oil drum or a, or a 55 gallon drum, and then you build a huge block of mud, which is dried out, it's called cob, and the duct work goes from the bottom of this oil uh, a 55 gallon drum, and it goes horizontally through all that mud. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is <clears throat> the rocket stove a has a, heat sink. a highly highly insulated chimney, only about two feet long. Yeah. But in that chimney, you get a really good draft. Yeah. And what happens when the, when the smoke hits, the, when, the, uh, when the, not smoke, when the, the gas hits that drum, the drum is exposed. So the gas immediately starts cooling off. So relative to the, to the gas in the flue of the, uh, ro of the rocket stove, this stuff is relatively heavy. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a strong updraft followed by a mild downdraft. And that is enough to power the gas through this horizontal flue. Oh, okay. Okay? Now, you can have a, a stove where the fire is 1,000 percent, 1,000 degrees Celsius, and the material coming out at the other end, exiting your house, is 70. Mm -hmm. This means that the waters of condensation are... Are, the, the steam in this thing is condensing inside your house mm -hmm. and the heat from that is going into that mud. Mm -hmm. So the mud will hold it. It's a big heat sink. All right, there you can get 80% efficiency or more. But in a stove where you have an 80% efficient stove, which very few are, most of them are the, of the ones that burn cordwood, the best you get is more like 73%. As I, as I recall. But it, that efficiency is cut because the heat from the 1,000 degrees of the, of the firebox, 300 degrees as it comes out the chimney. And you don't have any condensation in your flue. And so the result of that is that your, your efficiency is being cut by 50% or more. So you're not going right to get... Right before you start. Right, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So and what you're saying is this wood is burned at a very high temperature. Yeah. Very high. High much, temperature. Much, much higher than a wood stove in your house. High, well, it depends upon the wood stove, but you want this burned. It's going to burn like it is in a pellet stove. Yeah. Or it's right. going to burn like it is in... Forced air. Forced kind of air, exactly. And you want it to burn really, really, really hot. Because yeah. if it does, then the creosote, the tar... That, the, and the mass of the particulates that in burns it too. are going to burn. Yeah. Now, the particulates that don't burn are ash, and the ash is relatively heavy. So if it gets out of your flue, which most of it does not, it's going to drop onto your garden. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, it fertilizes <laughs> your garden. Instead of going into your neighbor's lungs yeah. or your lungs. Yeah, or your lungs. So these are, these are considerations. You know, we started... A little bit, about a minute more than an hour ago, I think. So I think it's time for us to say goodbye to everybody. Well, we're running, we're running out, out of that hour. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I think we had a couple of minutes to start. So we will say goodbye for goodbye. this week. Uh, but are we going to stay here and talk? We Why can not? do it if you want. <laughs> so the people who are who are wa watching on on a streaming web. Uh, broadcast can can watch and unfortunately for those people who are getting the broadcast elsewhere um, y we advise you to to get online and watch the rest there by going <laughs> that's a good idea you could do it I don't know how I don't know how good it is but the uh, getting back to this other thing the the thing that struck me was this was not a victory the stopping this this thing 
from from uh, being being produced in the stopping the biomass thing from being built in um, in Springfield was not a victory. It was not what I would call a victory. It sounds like a little bit of misinformation was driving it. There was misinformation. The the percentage of of um, the percentage of of uh, uh, efficiency is one. Mm -hmm. But but another thing too is if you look at a conventional wood stove and what it's putting into the air and you compare it with a with a typical scrubbed, tended, legal biomass plant. They are, it's, it, they are in, entirely you different. You can't compare them. You no. can't compare them. It's like a, an oil well that's been set on fire like those things in Kuwait were, were where you had a huge amount of, of smoke coming mm -hmm. up and you compare that with a, uh, an engine which has got catalytic converters on it and stuff like that. The emissions are, are two, two entirely different things. And one of the things that has struck me is we are burning 650,000 cords, if I remember correctly, of wood every year in Vermont. And that bur wood is very largely being bur burned. In home stoves. In home stoves that are I relatively inefficient. Mm -hmm. And old. They're old and they're polluters. Exactly. Now, the reason why that's important for the people who burn that is because it's the least expensive source of energy, uh, of heat that we've got. We've got it, Vermont. That's, and when that's you, correct. When you compare it with propane, you know, or something like that, oil, mm -hmm. it's the propane, the oil, twice as much. At least. There is another source of energy which is um, as, as about the same cost as firewood, and that is the cost of running a heat pump. Okay. And the reason, as we, you know, as you know, is because these heat pumps are not making heat; they're moving heat. They're moving it, they're not and it's a whole, it. yep. yeah, it's a whole lot more efficient to move the heat than it is to create it. Now, this is a technology that's catching up with the times. I mean, 20 years ago, a heat pump wouldn't work very well in Vermont. Well, 20 years ago, a heat pump wasn't efficient enough to work in Vermont. Yeah, it would work in the spring, in the spring and the fall. Well, it was pretty popular down in South Carolina. Yeah, but up, up here they weren't quite making. Now they are. Now they are, and they've got heat pumps that at let's see, see if I can remember the numbers. At at seven degrees, they're more than ninety percent efficient. At fifteen below, they're still above fifty percent efficient. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a that's a tremendous improvement. That's a tremendous improvement, and so a person who's got a heat pump. You really kind of have to guard against the the um, the uh, really terribly cold weather if you live in a place where the temperature is going to go below ten below zero, mm -hmm. which a lot of Vermont does. But you can do that by well, you're using. You're still getting the heat. It's just you're just losing efficiency. You're well. The you you don't have to lose the efficiency. You can turn your thermostat down if it, if that. You yeah, know. you can do that. I mean, if it if if you're getting ninety percent efficiency at, at zero, and you want to retain that ninety percent efficiency when it goes to twenty below, you can turn you your thermostat exactly. down yeah. from sixty eight to forty eight. You know. Yeah. And you'll oh, yeah. you'll be yeah. back where you were if you you know and you can live in forty eight. You just wear a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, people in Vermont been doing that for a long, long time. Actually, I live in an apartment where the thermostat is set at 50. Yeah, and I don't. I, I, I don't blame <laughs> you. Most people would not put up with that. But I do find myself at 5 o'clock in the morning working on my blog in a T-shirt. Really? I'm Yes, and I'm oh. comfortable with that. I really am. I come out of my bedroom and I walk into that 48 degrees and it's like walking into heat. <laughs> my bedroom is cold. Everything is relative. <laughs> Everything is, is relative. relative. I wear a hat to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I was telling somebody about that and he said he knew a woman who was in her 80s who, who, who could not stand sleeping in heated space. So she slept on a screen and porch year round, regardless of the outside temperature. Yeah. And the one thing that she did, she had a very warm Arctic sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that she did was she had a, an electric blanket inside the sleeping bag. 
Oh, which she, she was toasty. She, she plugged in the, <laughs> the electric blanket 10 minutes before she went to bed. Okay. And then when she got into bed, she turned it off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, and she was, she was fine. And I'll bet she wore a hat, too. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 um, the, if the efficiency of, of wood gasification followed by, by making electricity and then using that using electricity the to make the heat is probably a better, in terms of the amount of heat that's delivered, it's probably a better use of wood than just burning the wood. Yeah, and so. the wood that they were talking about burning in, in North Springfield was not cordwood. It was, a, it was a cheaper source of, of basically forest refuse. Well, that meeting we went to, yeah. uh, where we had the state guys down there and all that, yeah. they, they were talking about that. There's, I think, if I remember correctly, there's veneer grade, yes. there's lumber grade, yes. and then there's several lower grades, right. the, the lowest of which is just basically twigs and branches. Yes. And these are real refuse. Right. Lower branches. Mm -hmm. They would have been or could have been left on a forest floor, mm -hmm. or they could be recovered. And in many cases, this is the source of the wood chips. Yeah. They're not well, making the wood, wood chips from prime wood. No. They're, they're gonna but make, I, I mean, wood chips can come from forest falls. Yeah. And, and I, I remember reading about a, an ice storm that hit New York. It was a particularly bad ice storm. And my recollection was that they had 50 million tons of forest wow. falls that they had to deal with. And a lot of this, of course, was all over the roads. And when you have, when you have fallen wood on the roads, that's something that has to be broken you up. You've got to get it out of there quick. Cut, a, cut up. You've got to get it out of there. You've got to do something with it. They didn't have anything to do. There were no plants to burn this stuff. Yeah. There was no way of chipping it all, so they dumped it in a lake. Oh. <laughs> you know, so. Doesn't it float? Well, if you get the wood, if you get the wood in there properly, it won't float. It won't even float. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, again, you fill it with lead. You shoot <laughs> <laughs> shotguns into it. Again, from the same meeting, it came out that I think that well, the state was giving out all the statistics and the numbers, and the numbers yeah. went in one ear and out the other. Yes. But what I got as a takeaway is that there is enough. Spare wood, if I can use that word, the wood you're talking about, yeah. not the prime grade, yeah. but enough of this spare wood or surplus wood, if yeah. you will, that could pr that could power two more generating stations the size of the one in Burlington. Okay, and how big is the one They're in 50 Burlington? Fifty megawatts. So we could get a hundred megawatts from 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 uh, from the entire state. From the entire state, in addition to what we're getting. And that 100 megawatts is approximately half of what we were getting once upon a time from Vermont Yankee. Yeah. So biomass should be a, um, and probably will be. It's, it's not a matter of, you know, it, whether it, it, it goes into North Springfield. Again, it's the dollars. It's it the dollars. It makes sense. Somebody yeah. is going to invest in it because there is a chance. And there's going to be some community in Vermont. You only need a few. There are going to be communities in Vermont that say, yes, if you want to build a biomass plant here, Do we here. will welcome you. We yeah. can use yeah. those jobs. Yeah. And we have done the science and realized that it's not going to pollute the way that it will, would pollute. And, you know, these, if these things are put out, if you put a biomass plant into Wilmington, for example, or into Brattleboro, for example, you could power not only the electricity, but you could recover the heat and use it for, for powering a large part of the town. And, and if you do that, okay, so you're emitting carbon, but what are you not emitting? What, what are you replacing? What oil, what coal, what, what have you? Are you, oh. you know, f cordwood, are you taking out of uh, the equation? And the answer is a lot. Yeah. It's going to be a lot. And by putting in new facilities that are designed to deal with the emissions properly and designed to be efficient, and I was unhappy with the North Springfield plant about its efficiency. I, I didn't think it was as efficient as it should have been. As it could have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. I didn't do a detailed analysis about it. I was just unhappy. I'm really unhappy that it got stalled or stopped. Yeah. But if you put, if you put a biomass plant into Wilmington, 
if you put it close enough to the middle of town, <clears throat> and Wilmington is not, you know, it doesn't have enough breadth that you couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You could pipe heat into the middle of town and have a district heating system. Oh, absolutely. There and and um, have that have that town be cozy. And if if uh, Hurricane Irene comes back, they could sit back and say, "Well, we've got our power plant." Disconnect the connection. Disconnect the connection, exactly. And maintain our heat, maintain our electricity, and keep going. And that's one reason, by the way, that I would not say, oh, we're going to have 200 megawatt plants. Was it two or 250 megawatt 250s. plants? 250s. We're, we're going to have 250 megawatt plants. What I would, 425s. Yeah. What I would advocate for a town like Wilmington would be that they have a, a 5 megawatt plant or a 10 megawatt plant. For, for Brattleboro, I would advocate something on the order of three five megawatt plants. If yeah. we had three five megawatt plants, we could get a lot of heat if we wanted to. We might not want to because that's expensive. But we could generate our electricity. And when you combine that with a smart grid, when Hurricane Irene comes back, we would be able to say, okay, we're disconnecting from the grid, we're repairing the damage, and then we're going to go. You know, we actually have a little bit of that in place already. How so? The uh, retreat. Oh, yes. The retreat has a running generator. It's three of them. Is it three? Three generators, and they're approximately a quarter megawatt each. Okay. And I know that they had and probably still have an arrangement with the utility. Yeah. Uh, they were very proud of that, and I think rightly so. To be able to put it online when the utility asks for it, and in exchange they get a favorable rate on their electricity. Yes. It's a good deal. It's a good deal for them. It really is. And uh, if we had a couple of more of those, we could power the town. There probably was one such thing at the hospital. I mean, the only reason I'm saying that is because of the chimney. Hard to know. Well, it's a big old chimney. It's yeah, been there a long they, time. They, they have, had something there that yeah, they're not but, using anymore. Yeah. But, you know, it's... it's I, th I, I think, you know, for... for a, the, uh, the thing that I would like to see would be every community in, in Vermont have a, a uh, generating facility sufficient to provide that community with a minimum amount of power that it needs just to keep going. Well, that's... Enough for the refrigerators. That's, for the, that's for actually a pretty good idea, and it's conceivable that it could happen. Yeah. But it isn't going to happen by itself. No, it's not going to happen by itself. And it's not going to happen by the investors. I say, you know, Wall Street. No, it's not going to happen by Wall Street. But, you know, it could happen by... Um, local investors. Local investors. Oh, yeah. Those B community, Corps. Community heat and power. Benefit Corps. Owned, yeah, Benefit Corps. Cooperatively Corps. owned. And this is something that I want to bring up to the um, town meeting, as a matter of fact. Mm. I want to... I'm, it's too late to, to put it... To bring it up as a, as a, as a warned item. Mm -hmm. But it's, we can bring it up as, an, as, as other business at the end. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is, is ask the, the select board to, ins, in, to instruct the, um, the uh, Energy Committee and the Finance Committee to work out uh, um, a, a plan for putting in sufficient electric generation to, to keep Brattleboro in a, in a minimum emergency style situation. A localized grid that would Enable I, us to isolate in the event it, right. there and, was a big... And I'd like to have, I'd actually, I think we have three substations, and I'd like to have one at each substation. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And then, and then what happens is, if, if Hurricane Irene comes, m maybe you have to have a rolling blackout after that, if that's what it comes to, because you don't have enough power. Mm. But if we have a smart grid, we aren't going to have to go to that, if everybody is on a smart grid, mm -hmm. if everybody's got smart meters. And... Um, the, the, but the, the interesting thing about this is if you look at the cost of the electricity that we are, what we're spending every year as a community on electricity, and this is money that comes into the businesses and it comes into people's pockets and then it leaves. Mm -hmm. It's about $25 million a year out of Brattleboro. Just out of Brattleboro. Just out of Brattleboro. And, of course, Brattleboro is going to be typical in that way. It has, sure. It has more commerce and it has more, more industry than... Marlboro, but Marlboro has Marlboro College, mm -hmm. you know, and and basically I think what it, what we come to is 
um, every community in, in Vermont has a reason to try to first separate itself from the grid, maintain its own power, and then second, connect itself to the next community mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. so that there could be mutual support. Mm -hmm. And Searsburg, I use this as a constant example, Searsburg, population 100, has a, has a nameplate capacity of, of 6 megawatts. Mm -hmm. It has, at the, if you take the capacity factor times the, the nameplate capacity, that means on average it's going to be producing about 2 megawatts of power. Mm -hmm. And because the, the facility's probably got a capacity factor of about 30 percent, might be more. But they're going to have two megawatts, and two megawatts would would be enough to power most of Wilmington. But TransCanada owns it. They want those those two megawatts. Yeah, right. When the grid is down, <laughs> they can come get it. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Bring a car you know, big enough to hold it. <laughs> there, there is a, a development along these lines that will help help us. What's that? Uh, some elements within the state. Don't ask me which departments has made an arrangement with a town in Austria, or maybe it's a county or something like it's that, a, it's that's, a, that's doing this kind of stuff. And it's kind of a... There's, a, there's that, that it's, a, it's the whole state, actually. Yeah, it has state, entered yeah. into, uh, um, in, entered into a, an agreement with the state of Upper Austria. Correct. Which is, which is okay. northwest of, of Vienna on the, so on, the German, on the German border. That happens once in a while, Tom, that I know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in Austria, this kind of stuff has been happening for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. so we got guys over there that yeah. are coming over here yeah. that have a lot of knowledge. Yeah. And they're coming over here to share their knowledge. Yeah. Another thing, too, is you were talking earlier about EVs and the batteries yeah. in the EVs yeah. and the effect of those batteries on the, you know, in the, in the grid. Um, as you get a smart smart grid, you can say to a car, now is the time to charge. There's extra. Exactly. And then later on, you can say, we need some of that power back again. And a car says, I'm not going to give it to you. And then they'll <laughs> say, well, we'll give you a little more money. And the car says, okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. The, the, um, if, if, if this works out the way, that it, the, the way that it might, you know, one thing that we could foresee here is that a person with a smart a smart meter could have an EV which is plugged in and made available to the to the grid and what happens is the electric company says okay if you need power we can give you power for free as long as you give it back for free mm -hmm. when we want it mm -hmm. and that means that that, I don't know that that would work. I mean, we'd have to see the numbers. But there's stuff like that that people are thinking about that will work. Yes. The other thing about these EV batteries and the, and the EVs as cars is that <clears throat> an electric vehicle has a huge battery. The, the um, Tesla has a, an 85 kilowatt hour battery. Now that's not, in terms of the, of the value of that, in, in grid power. No, it's a diff it's, it's not a, it's the same name but it's totally different. Well, what I'm saying is in terms of the amount of amount of power that it stores, yeah. it's storing 85 kilowatt hours. Okay, but it cycles. That's right. That battery at 85 kilowatt hours is not going to be delivering a whole lot of value of battery to the grid. Because 85 kilowatt hours even if we were at 20 cents per kilowatt hour We'd we'd still we'd still be at at you know seventeen dollars worth of power in there or something. Okay. Okay. But nevertheless, it's not seventeen dollars worth of power. At 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 gr the lowest grid demand, the wholesale price of power actually goes negative. Yeah. It would be in the interest of the utility to throw that electricity away, powering those cars. Yep. Yeah. When the, when the grid demand gets high, I, I read that during an ice storm recently, um, Green Mountain Power was paying 60 cents a kilowatt hour for, for power, which it was selling to resi residences for, you know, 16 cents or whatever it was. That is six zero is what they're paying and one six is what they're, what they're getting. They're losing money, mm -hmm. a lot of money mm -hmm. on every kilowatt hour. And that, that at a dollar a kilowatt hour, that... And and grid power does go over a dollar a kilowatt hour sometimes. Mm -hmm. Peaking power. Peaking power, right? That eighty-five kilowatt hours 
if you could get it back at that, would be worth 85 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, the, pr the price of power goes negative, mm -hmm. and the price of power goes high. Mm -hmm. And so the utility, under those circumstances, could actually make money in both transactions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wall it, Street's figured that out for a long time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, the other thing that's neat about this is that those EV batteries don't last forever. Right. And the thing that makes it that neat is that there are certain demands that are placed on the batteries when they're used, used by electric vehicles that are never placed on them when they're used on the grid. And when that battery is too old for an electric vehicle and it starts getting kind of pokey and, and, the, and the owner says, well, I want to swap it out, and he spends however much it takes to do that, which in the case of this thing might be over $10,000, um, that battery is still got about 65% of its useful life ahead of it as, a, as an EV battery. As a storage device. So, which... No, no longer good for a car, <clears throat> but, but, but you good could, to sit down and store, device, store energy And there the is grid. going to be a big market in these things because anybody who's off-grid is going to want an EV yep. battery yep. because it'll be good, high-quality storage, and the grid is going to want an EV battery. Yep. So these... And if you think about... 150,000 million cars in the United States. There might be 150 million. If we had 100 million cars and 10% and of them were, were holding 85 kilowatt hours each, mm -hmm. all right, that's 10 million times 85 kilowatt hours, mm -hmm. which I think, am I wrong? Is that 850 gigawatt hours? early in the morning. Yeah, right. <laughs> that sounds would, good. That would put a huge dent into American grid demand. Absolutely. You know, if you have a, if you have, and you know, that by itself, if you had a, if you had a power outage that lasted for a day, and you had a smart grid, and these cars could, could deliver power lo locally, that would, that would, that would mean a great deal. We're moving into a new, into a different future, and I got to admit that in some certain senses, I think it's kind of a minefield, because I don't think we're ready for a for a geomagnetic s storm, for example. Oh, well, don't even talk about that. <laughs> well, people should know about it, it. It could happen. It could happen. I think the they were worried that it would happen in 2013, and hopefully, that danger is past. I don't know that it is, but basically, we could have every. Un unprotected computer we've got, and almost all of them are unprotected, fried by a geomagnetic magnetic storm that would also fry all of our capacitors, not, not capacitors, transformers. Transformers. And there are no f big factories in the United States that are making big f transformers. And, and there's no stockpile. And there's no stockpile. So what do we do? I don't think I have it on this, on this USB drive, but I got a picture of one of those transformers. It's about as big as this room. This is a large room. Yeah. Just one transformer. I was going to say it's got to be the size of a tractor trailer. Yeah, that's about right. Just to, just arrayed a little bit differently, but yeah, yeah. And like you said, there's there's nobody there's nobody in America making them. You know, you can get them from Siemens in Germany, you can get them from China, but they're not sitting on the shelf. And furthermore, if we have a geomagnetic storm of that type, um, every country on Earth is going to want as many of them as they can get, as fast as they can get them. Well, there are things that can be done in anticipation of the storm, and you need, you got about eight minutes, I think, from the minute you know it's it's going to happen till it hits the earth. I think you, you might have longer than that. Maybe you do, but the point I mean, of it, the you, point they, of it is they come there are things that can be done, yeah. and places like England have done it. Okay. We haven't. Okay. You know, and then things like taking these transformers offline before the storm hits. Interesting. So that, that's a fairly easy fix. For well, it could even be done manually. Yeah. There's definitely a disconnect at those transformers. You know, I was reading about, a, I was reading about a, a major power outage that took place, and I don't even remember when. It was years ago. And um, it might have been the outage in 2003 in the northeastern United States. And there was an attempt to stop the outage. 
and uh -huh. the attempt was had a good chance of success. The, the problem was the station that needed to have the switch thrown was not manned. Oh, boy. Yeah. So yeah. the opportunity was lost. And, you know, the... The, 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 you're, were you around for the, for the Northeast power outage in 1965? I was. I was in, in New York at the time. So was I. Were you? <laughs> Where were you? Uh, Klein's department store in a shoe department. Where is it? 14th Street. 14th Street. The lights went out, and I was in a shoe department, and I happened to be looking at a brand of shoes whose logo was to the feet. Okay. And they were day glow. Oh, my gosh. So the lights went out, and all I could see is all these little tiny feet glowing oh. at me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was, I was in, uh, at Pratt Institute where I was a yeah, student. Yeah, okay. And, um, you know, it, was, it, was, um, it happened that, that, you know, Pratt is very close to the Brooklyn Navy, the old Brooklyn Navy Yard. Mm -hmm. well, it was still going at that time. And the dormitory that I lived in was a high-rise building. And you could see the Navy Yard from the dormitory. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking up the stairs in the dormitory, which was, for me, it was seven flights. For some of the kids, it was like 16. Wow. But yeah. um, walking and hearing somebody say, it's a nuclear war. They shut off the lights so, so, you know, so the planes would be unable to find New York or whatever it was. And I said, if that was true, the lights wouldn't be on in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and they are. Good point. You know, and the and the, um, but it was it was a. Uh, we heard a lot of stories about what went on. I I had friends who were. I had one, a couple of friends who were on a subway train under the East River, at the time Ooh. that the thing happened, and they had to find their way out. Mm -hmm. And they sat in the car for something like an hour and a half, and then somebody came down the track with a flashlight and said, "I'm going to take some of you out of here." And they went down the track by the light of that flashlight. And the guy had to walk back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between where they were and the nearest station, which might have been a mile away. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. But it was that, there have been a lot of power outages since then. Mm -hmm. At that time, they said, we're going to figure out what went wrong. We're going to stop it. We're going to make it resilient. We're going to have security. It's not going to happen again. And of course, it just happens over and over and over. And it looks to me like they just get worse and worse and worse. We had a power outage that was similar in 2003. Uh, last year, or was it the year before, 2011 or 12, I think. Might, I think it might have been 2012, it might have been 2013. They had a pair of power outages on subsequent days in India, which mm -hmm. were huge. Mm -hmm. And they threw, about, they threw over 10% of the world population out of power. <laughs> As I recall, okay, it's just it's it's mind-boggling. But the, you know, the, we are so dependent upon these big. We're we're dependent on dinosaurs. Is basically what it comes down to. Well, yeah. Uh, at the time they were created, they were probably the best solution to the problem. I mean, the the generating stations, the the, fir the earliest generating stations for the most part were huge. Yeah, we got Niagara Falls. We had the TVA. We had the what's the Hoover Dam. Uh, we had huge coal bur coal burning plants and huge coal burning plants as well. And the co huge coal burning plants had to be in places where you could bring in cars, car after car after car of coal, or and barges, or and barges. So you had to have yeah. not just a rail siding, but a big rail siding. Oh yeah, and you had to have or a barge. You couldn't well, you do it, have by it right truck. down right down here, uh, North Northfield. Maybe it's a little further south, but there was, there was a coal burning station there. The station's still there, but it's burning on that natural gas now. Really, I didn't know. But that. it wasn't very long ago where you could see that yard full of coal cars. Oh my gosh! North of Springfield, Holyoke, maybe somewhere around. That makes sense. And, and you see it as you go by the uh, on on the interstate. Yeah. The plant's still there. Yeah. But it's no longer burning coal. Well, and it's a good thing, too. You know, I mean, there's an awful lot of streams and rivers and ponds in Vermont where you can't fish and eat oh, the yeah. fish because of the mercury. And where did the mercury come from? Coal. I knew you were going to say that. 
You knew, how did you know? <laughs> Here I was hoping I could surprise you. <laughs> Second order consequences. No one ever thought of them. Well, you know, they had the idea that you could take plutonium and drop it into the Atlantic Ocean and everything would be dandy because the ocean was so big. Yeah. And it's just, it really what it boils down to is a, a basic lack, and it, it amazes me almost, except that I, I can understand it easily. Even engineers who you would think would have an, an intuitive grasp of this uh, don't. It's, it's a lack of capacity to compare huge numbers and very tiny numbers and, and keep them all in perspective. But there's one thing that, that I have heard, and if you actually do the work, do the math, you find that it's true, that show, tells you about big numbers and little numbers. And the, and the thing that I've heard is, if you think about Julius Caesar, and at the end of his life, the last thing he did was he said, et tu brute, and then he dropped dead. As he said, et tu brute, he breathed out. And somewhere inside you, there are pro probably atoms that were in that breath. <laughs> this is true of every human being on earth, mm -hmm. because the number of atoms in that breath is so big <laughs> that when you compare it to the, to the size of the, of the of the atmosphere and the, and the dusting of the surface of the earth, you realize they've settled all over the place, mm -hmm. you know? And they're probably in the, the, the overwhelming majority of human beings somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to believe if you just do the math. It's so hard to believe if you don't, <laughs> you know? But when you think about that and you think about, okay, plutonium, yeah, it's bad, but if you just drop it here, it'll be okay. And how, how soluble is it? Well, that's not very soluble. It's not likely that it's going to cause any trouble. But if you keep dropping it, and you keep dropping it, and you keep dropping it, you're going to wind up having plutonium move everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine who is a toxicologist, and I honestly I think that he didn't quite get plutonium because the, because the actual nature of the poison was not completely known at the time. But he said a half a, I'm thinking that it's a half a pound, but it was probably a half a kilo. Half a kilo of plutonium dropped into the harbor of the city of New York would kill anybody who got into that water for a quarter of a million years. Wow. And the reason is because it is so poisonous. Now the reason why plutonium is poisonous is very similar to the reason why radi radon is poisonous. The radon, you go into your basement, there's granite. The granite is giving off radon. It comes from the, from the, from the um, natural the, uh, uh, decay of thorium. Thorium has a half-life of 14 billion years. So it decays very, very slowly. You've got very little radon in your basement. But what is there if you breathe it in? The radon has a half-life of a couple of days. And if it happens to be inside you when it decays, then it turns into radium, and you've got radium inside you. And that radium, when it decays, is going to give off an alpha particle. And that alpha particle is going to attack the next cell that it hits. Alpha particles coming from outside, they're stopped by... They're st by your skin. By your skin. They're st by the dead cells on the yeah. surface of your skin. An alpha particle will be stopped by a sheet of paper. Yeah. Because, but it will get through a cell wall. It'll go that far pretty reliably, and if it get, once it gets into that cell, if it hits your DNA, it's going to mess it up. Mm -hmm. and, and that mess up can cause cancer. Mm -hmm. And that cell will reproduce. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a problem because you've got a, an atom of radon inside you. And that atom of radon comes from the, ra ra of radium rather, which comes from the radon, which comes from the granite, the thorium in the granite. Well, plutonium is the same kind of thing. It's a, it's a nasty poison, but the thing that really makes it a bad poison, I am told, I don't know this is true absolutely, is that it gives off alpha particles. So you get the well, tiniest, that makes sense. That, tiniest that little makes particle sense. of radon, of plutonium that in makes your a system. Lot of sense. Yeah, can cause a real big mischief. So if the plutonium is dissolved into the water, and one thing people don't know, 
is that water really is a universal solvent. Everything dissolves in water to some degree. Pretty Ag much. Again, if you're willing to accept the idea of a really small number, you know, all right, so if you've got a ton of something and a billionth of an ounce of it will dissolve when it's submerged in water, that's dissolved. It's there. Okay. And the plutonium will dissolve, and if you get into the water, you will be exposed to it because, by golly, it is Caesar, and that is that breath coming out. You know, <laughs> yeah. and then you're in trouble. And that's that's one of the problems with 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 nuclear um, materials is that, you know, they are. In the case of in the case of mercury, there's a certain amount you can tolerate. Mm -hmm. In the case of alpha emitters that get inside you. There is no amount you can tolerate, you know. You cannot tolerate. Um, it's, it's the one that causes the trouble. It's, the, it's, the, it's, it's no longer a matter of you can tolerate a certain amount. It's a question of which side, what, what, what numbers come up on the dice. I read something about exactly that within the last week. Really? Yeah, about the difference between ingesting something and being exposed to radiation and ingesting something that has radiation. Interesting. I, yeah. I, the particular thing I think they talked about was polonium. Yeah, well, polonium you, you is... You carry a, a, a test tube full of polonium in your breast pocket for a month and it wouldn't do a damn thing to you. Yeah. But if, if you had as much as a grain of salt in your food... Oh, my it'd gosh. It'd probably kill you. Probably. Yeah. I would guess that it would, well, it would it more almost than more than Very probably. As yeah. Yasser Arafat could probably tell you. Yeah. And a few other guys. What was that uh, Russian scientist? I don't know. There's been a bunch it? of them who were killed with plutonium. Well, he knew he had it. And it took him about two weeks to die a very miserable death. Yeah. Well, yeah. We are at the end of our second hour. Kind of looks that way, doesn't it? Maybe we should close up shop. <laughs> what do you think? Well, they haven't dropped anything on the floor to tell us, so maybe they don't need it, but I think it's probably enough time. <laughs> okay. So for the second time today, Tom and I will say goodbye. And we hope to see you, or not see you, because we can't look and see people. We look at the, <laughs> we look out here, and what we see is ourselves. Just we see the same thing you oh, do. Oh, NSA can see them though. <laughs> you never can tell. <laughs> you never can tell. We hope you will see us again next week. Let's put it that way, as we shut down our computers. And we hope it is a delightful week for you in the meantime. See. I'm not going to shut that computer down, but I am going to shut this one down if I can figure out how to do it. Shut down. Bingo. I have to get a new computer.